So welcome everyone. Um, I'm here in my role with the Brown Center. My name is Dr. Melinda Hall, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm here to introduce our wonderful Dr. John York, Professor of Chemistry, and he is here to discuss just, I, I'm really excited about this idea of nature being inspiring. He's talking about metals and their reactivity with small molecules. So how is it, uh, he is going to cover, that metals become useful for vital life processes in interesting reactions? Um, I'm looking very forward to this talk, and I'd love to turn it over to Dr. York now. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so the way I'll do this today, you know, I've, I've seen some of these on YouTube and different, different disciplines handle their presentations in different ways, but um, as a chemist, I'm going to give a kind of presentation, a history, if you will, a, um, a narrative of the, the way I have gone about doing research at Stetson, which I think is probably the way a lot of people go about doing research at a, an institution like Stetson. So please uh, feel free to um, chime in if you have any questions at any time. Um, you don't have to wait for me to finish up if you've got questions. I see I've got a lot of my students here. So I've, I've geared this talk. I'm going to turn my camera off here. Um, I've geared this talk towards not just faculty, but a lot of my students as well. So uh, as Dr. Hall said, I want to kind of try to show you the inspiration that I had. Um, so I, I've entitled this talk, Metals, Small Molecules, and Life. And I'm a bioinorganic chemist at heart. And a bioinorganic chemist is, is a chemist that studies this interface of biology and inorganic chemistry. And a lot of people think that that's kind of an oxymoron. Um, I'm also what I would consider um, a reductionist. I like to look big and then try to understand things by going um, small. And I think the best place to start is, is the earth, right? Um, all life on Earth as we know it operates under a, a simple principle, right? We're all basically like a cell phone. We use electricity, in a sense, to drive all of our life processes, right? We're a little different from this, but it's, it, it's all the flow of electrons. And so um, we can think about electrons as having this uh, high energy or high potential electrons as the source. And we've got this sink. These we want to put these electrons somewhere in a much lower energy. And just like we can charge our cell phone using this potential energy, um, we can run this electricity through our cell phone or through our battery and charge it. Um, that's basically the way all life on Earth works. We take high potential sources of electrons. We strip them down this, uh, this chain, and we tease energy from this. And I've always been fascinated with the way that life on Earth uh, functions in this way. Um, when we think about how we do that, how, how does life on Earth do this, um, here's my periodic table. Can't be a chemist without showing the periodic table. And these are kind of what we consider the traditional elements of life. You know, you might call them the organic elements of life, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. Um, these are the ones that most people think of when they think of these life processes that we can use to extract energy and to live. The reality is, though, um, there are a lot of other elements that are critical for life on Earth. And these other elements are all metals. So as an inorganic chemist, bioinorganic, I look to see how do these different metals uh, function to help us you know, live, to extract this energy. And there's a lot of these metals in our bodies, right? Calcium, potassium, sodium, and magnesium. We've got a kilogram to hundreds of grams of these things in our body. Uh, a lot of these, you know, calcium, for instance, is in our bones. So there's a lot of that there. But we've also got these other uh, metals in the middle here. Um, these are our transition metals for the inorganic chemistry students out there. And these are also crucial to life on Earth. The ones that are in blue are ones that we as humans need to survive. The vanadium, molybdenum, and, and tungsten, there are other microorganisms that utilize them. We don't really utilize them. Um, but they're present in much smaller amounts. Iron in the most uh, amount, about 4.2 grams. 
all the way down to cobalt, which is about three milligrams. So you can kind of think of a, a typical ibuprofen tablet's about 200 milligrams. So um, we've got one one hundredth of that of cobalt in our bodies, but we need that to survive. And these are important because over half of all the proteins in our bodies that actually are the machines that make these life processes possible have a metal. And most of these, it's actually the metal that does the important chemistry. All of the, uh, the organic elements of life are basically just there um, to, to help the metal do what it needs to do. And just to kind of take a step back, you know, we're going to be talking about proteins a lot in this, uh, this talk. Uh, just as a reminder, um, we take those organic elements and we can make these amino acids here, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We can put these amino acids together in these chains uh, that we call uh, peptides. We string them together um, and these peptides have different structures, or, or excuse me, the, uh, the amino acids have different structures, of course. Um, these R groups on here are different chemical um, structures, and we can put these together to make these proteins, these three-dimensional molecules that are uh, organic in nature, and they can function to do all of these different types of chemistry that we need to, to survive. But again, um, these are organic molecules, big ones, um, but there's some important limitations to the things that they can do. Most of Earth and life on Earth revolves around, arguably, I would say, I, I kind of break it down like this, into four very small molecules. Um, the first is, of course, is water, okay, for a variety of reasons that we'll see. Um, the second one is dinitrogen, N2, um, carbon dioxide, and dioxygen. So these four molecules and the reactions that they do are basically the driving force of all the life on Earth, okay? And where metals come in is that these organic elements don't react very easily with these four molecules. So they can't very easily participate in this transfer of electrons that we were talking about earlier that allows these life processes to happen. So this is where metals step in, and metals can react with these molecules. They can extract energy from them, if you will, and that's where the bio-inorganic comes in, okay? So we talk about metalloproteins. These are proteins that contain metals in them, and metals bind with what we call ligands, and this is a word that we're going to see a lot, so I just wanted to kind of introduce it. A ligand is anything that binds to a metal, and usually the ligand contains either nitrogen, sulfur, or oxygen. Right? Those tend to bind very well with metals. And if we look at these different amino acids, there are actually uh, five amino acids that have nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur as part of their structure, and it's these atoms that can bind to the, the metals in the proteins. So these metalloproteins contain these amino acids that can bind to the metal. And they hold the metal in place and they tune its properties to allow it to do all kinds of amazing chemistry. A good example I like to, to throw out, um, it's one of my favorites, is alcohol dehydrogenase. Okay, so this is the three-dimensional structure of alcohol dehydrogenase, this protein. And uh, alcohol dehydrogenase evolved because yeast produced ethanol. And they produced ethanol, they believe, basically as a defense mechanism because it kills off bacteria and other things that are competing for their, their food sources. So they produce ethanol that kills um, the other uh, competing microorganisms. Well, animals eat fermenting fruit. You know, fruit falls off of a tree and they eat uh, these, this fruit. And ethanol is a poison. And if it builds up in your bodies, it, it will kill you. So we've evolved this protein that can take ethanol and get rid of it. And this is a really interesting uh, metalloenzyme. It contains zinc at what we call the active site, the important point in the, uh, the protein that actually does the chemistry. And we can see here when we talk about these amino acids functioning as a ligand to the metal, we see a cysteine, a histine, and another cysteine bound to the metal. And then up here at the top is our ethanol molecule bound. And so the ethanol actually binds to the zinc 
metal center in this protein, and it's converted into acetaldehyde, which is much easier for the body to then convert into acetic acid, and it gets rid of it, and it just gets flushed away. Um, why do we need the zinc? Because ethanol is not very reactive on its own, and once it binds to the zinc, it's approximately 100 million times more reactive than it is when it's not bonded to the zinc. And so this zinc acts as what we call a catalyst to make this reaction happen. And that's what metals do. They react and they function as catalysts to make these important chemical reactions happen. And so now I just wanted to talk about these other three big picture molecules uh, and just these are fascinating because, like I said, these are the most important chemical reactions on Earth, in my opinion, and they're all um, made possible by metals. And so dinitrogen, dinitrogen, it's a very inert molecule. It makes up about 80% of our atmosphere. Um, and if we zoom into this field, we can see some clover here. And if we zoom in from the clover, if you look at the roots, there are these things called root nodules. And in these root nodules live certain types of bacteria. And these bacteria are able to take nitrogen and utilize this enzyme, this protein called nitrogenase, um, to react with nitrogen in the air. And if you zoom into nitrogenase, there's this you know, amazing metal center. It contains uh, seven iron centers. It contains a molybdenum center. It's got all of these sulfur atoms. It's, it even has right in the very center there uh, an inorganic carbide um, anion. It's the only existence of this in nature where you have carbon with nothing else bound to it um, as a ligand to metals. And this protein is able to take nitrogen, which is incredibly inert, um, take very high potential electrons from the microorganism and reduce the uh, dinitrogen into ammonia. And this is super important because all of those amino acids that we need to make proteins and do all of that stuff, well, it comes from this nitrogen in the air and the, uh, the ammonia. And um, so these crops like clovers and soybeans, one of the reasons that they're used to plant in fields between crops is because they're able to re-energize the soil by charging it up with lots of ammonia. Um, so these types of uh, um, crops are really useful. And I've always been fascinated by this. It was one of the first metalloproteins I ever studied. And there was just a paper out in Science last year, which is the, the, the premier um, journal for science in the world and they found the new crystal structure of dinitrogen actually bonded to one of the iron centers in the, um, the, the, the metal cluster here. So this was about 35 years in the, uh, the making to try to get this. Um, another important thing to point out here is why do we care? Approximately 5% of all global energy production, 5%, is used to turn nitrogen into ammonia to, um, for fertilizers. It's incredibly energy intensive. It, in, it requires very high pressures, very high temperatures. These bacteria can do it at room temperature and one atmosphere pressure on the roots of a clover plant. So if we can understand how it works in nature, we can then maybe gain inspiration from that and design better, more efficient, more environmentally friendly catalytic processes to do the things that we need. So this is an amazing reaction. Um, followed close behind uh, is probably this one where we take carbon dioxide and if we zoom into our leaves and even further, we get down to our chloroplasts and we get to this protein here. Um, this is photosystem two. Uh, this is an amazing protein. It's incredibly complex. And what photosystem two does is it takes light from the sun, it absorbs this light and takes electrons and pushes them up to really high uh, potential. Okay, so remember to do, to, to use energy, we need high potential electrons. So photosynthesis kicks these things really high up and then um, the, the plants are able to use that energy to convert carbon dioxide into sugars 
which they can then use for, um, for energy. But they're interested in this protein for a different reason. Once you've kicked these electrons up, now the protein needs electrons. You've just stripped them away. And as we chemists know, you can't just take electrons away. Now we've got to replace them. Uh, otherwise, the system doesn't work. It's like cutting your, your, uh, your cord on your, um, on your TV. It doesn't work if the electrons can't flow. And so what we need to do and what plants need to do is they need a source of electrons. Uh, and if we zoom into here, there's this thing um, that's another amazing multi-metal center. This time it's got manganese in there. It's got one, two, three, four manganese, um, a calcium, and all these waters and oxides around. And this is another amazing center. Um, water. Water has very is a very stable molecule. It has very low potential electrons. They don't want to go anywhere. But this uh, this protein, photosystem two, once the electrons have been stripped, it's incredibly deficient in electrons. So much though that it can steal electrons from water and turn it into dioxygen. Um, the plant doesn't care about the oxygen. The plant just needs to steal the electrons from the water so that it can keep going through its photosynthesis. Um, the, the oxygen is just an un, uh, unrelated byproduct. Um, but we can see here, it's these two oxygens that I've circled here that are believed to actually come together to form dioxygen. And this dioxygen is a really high energy molecule. It's very unhappy. It didn't like having its electrons stolen and turned into O2. It wants those electrons back. And that's good for us because we now utilize the dioxygen uh, in our blood uh, to do our, our chemistry, right? So we're kind of competing with photosynthesis. Um, this is hemoglobin. So this is the crystal structure of hemoglobin. And of course, it has iron in there. And this is the crystal structure of iron bound to dioxygen. And this dioxygen is carried through the body. A lot of people really never think we know we need oxygen to breathe. You know, you're going to be dead in a minute without it. But why do we need oxygen? The main reason we need oxygen is because we need, when we're running our electrons through our electron transport chain to extract energy from it, you have to have a place to put those electrons. You have to have the sink. And we take these high potential electrons that we get from carbohydrates, foods that are made by plants. And we need to dump those into this oxygen. Remember, we said we really want uh, oxygen really wants electrons. So if we can just give them to it, it will take them and be very happy. And if it's happy, we can dump those electrons there. The problem is, even though oxygen is very uh, reactive, it needs something to help these electrons flow. And that's where our metals come in. And this is the active site of this protein called cytochrome C oxidase. Cytochrome C oxidase uh, has a copper and an iron at the active site. And here's this little oxygen molecule. It binds right in between the two, um, kind of halfway between the copper and the iron. And it allows the electrons to flow through the copper into the oxygen and splits it back into the two water molecules that we started with. So photosynthesis takes electrons from water and turns it into oxygen. We take the oxygen and dump electrons back into it um, to turn it back into water. Um, kind of an interesting side point is if we take this dioxygen and we replace it with um, another molecule, this is cyanide. Cyanide, you may have heard of cyanide before, right? It's a poison you know, from the spy movies. If you take a cyanide capsule, it kills you. Well, cyanide kills you because it binds right there in cytochrome C oxidase, the same place the oxygen binds. And if it binds there, oxygen can't bind. We can't convert oxygen to water. It basically shuts down our entire electron transport chain and we die within you know, a few minutes. So just kind of an interesting side note, um, cyanide binding there, another small molecule causes us to die. And so this kind of is just a, a broad background in why metals matter in chemistry. Here are three of the most important kinds of uh, reactions for life, and they all involve metals at their core. And so this has always fascinated me. And when I came to Stetson, 
um, I wanted to study these kinds of reactions. Um, reactions of small molecules like dioxygen, uh, nitrogen, and I wanted to do it experimentally. Um, but when I came to Stetson, uh, things change. I think things change a lot for most faculty when they come to Stetson and other places like it. Um, you have to kind of morph your ideas and what you want to study for various reasons. And as I, when I first got here, I still loved the idea of, of studying these kind of compounds, but I was very interested also in these uh, copper centers that form bonds with alkenes. An alkene is a molecule, as our chemistry students will know, that has a carbon-carbon double bond. And in graduate school, I had made some compounds that had these carbon-carbon double bonds that were bonded to um, to copper centers. And you know, here was a good example of a crystal structure that I solved that had copper directly bonded to um, aromatic ring. And you might say, okay, well, this is interesting, but what does this have to do with all of this chemistry we've been talking about. We've been talking about these molecules like dioxygen and nitrogen. Now you're all of a sudden switching to an organic molecule, an alkene. Um, what does that have to do with anything? Well, sometimes biology is best learned through small molecules, right? Trying to work with these large proteins can be really difficult. And I like working with these kind of small molecules. Um, why alkenes? What does that have to do with biology? Well, it turns out there's an alkene called ethylene. It's the simplest alkene, actually, and it's an incredibly important molecule. You may have heard of it. Um, probably the most common occurrence of ethylene in, in you know, general society is fruit ripening. Um, ethylene is a hormone that is produced by plants that causes the fruit to ripen. So when you see a banana going from green to brown, that's because it's producing ethylene and that ethylene is causing the plant to, to ripen. Um, actually, pretty much all major uh, biological functions of plants are controlled by ethylene, right? Germination of seeds, controlled by ethylene. Um, the flowering of plants, um, controlled by ethylene. Uh, the basic death, if you will, controlled death of the plant. So for instance, the changing of the colors of the leaves as plants die in the fall, also controlled by ethylene. And even the loss of the leaves, it's all controlled by ethylene. And for a long time, we look at this molecule and we try to understand how can something so simple cause such dramatic changes in a, um, in a plant. And that's where I had seen in my own work that copper and other metals can bind to alkenes like ethylene. And this was probably um, what's going on in the protein. And in the late 90s, um, the ethylene receptor protein was fully characterized. We call it ETR1. And there was this seminal report where uh, a, a group published also in science discovered that copper was indeed at the center of the ethylene receptor. Now, they didn't really know what it did at the time, but they were able to do these experiments to show that there was copper there. And they were able to uh, get the primary amino acid sequence, okay, of all of the amino acids in this protein, the first 128 being shown to be where the ethylene bound. And so remember we talked about these no acid residues that can bind to metals. They went in and they started looking at all of these cysteines and histidines, all these nitrogen and sulfur uh, containing amino acids. And they hypothesized looking at these and basically trying to see which ones were close together, that it was probably this cysteine 65 and this histidine 69 that would bind to the copper. The copper could then bind to ethylene and voila, the, the protein could do all of these things that it did with ethylene. And their working hypothesis was based on some other things that these 128 amino acids would curl together to form this three, um, three different uh, helices in the protein and that there was the cysteine and histidine, they were probably close together and they would bind to the copper which could then bind ethylene and that then somehow 
this binding um, mode would change the protein in some way that would cause the hormones properties to be expressed. So this was their working hypothesis um, that I wanted to then investigate because most of the people working in this field are plant physiologists. Um, so they study mostly the plants themselves, not so much the chemistry, particularly from a molecular standpoint. Um, so I figured this would be somewhere I could really make an impact. And, and so I started not only doing some synthetic chemistry, but some computational chemistry. And computational chemistry, for those that don't know, we're using sophisticated computer software to model chemical systems. Um, it's incredibly accurate. It's state, we use state-of-the-art programs. Um, they allow us to find molecular structures. They allow us to look at bonding and reactivity. Um, and more importantly, it gives you insight into the chemistry that you really can't get sometimes through experiment. Uh, my students, that some of you are there here, are getting some really good exposure to computational chemistry uh, right now in our class. And so we, I got a, a grant from the ACS PRF fund that allowed me to buy a lot of my computers that I use, that allowed me to uh, buy a lot of the software that I use. We got a grant from the NSF that allowed us to uh, update our facilities and, and um, buy stuff and outfit a new computational chemistry lab. And so we were all set um, to, to do some of this work. And so our research question was, uh, number one, taking this as our assumption that this is what's going on in the protein, what are the major components of copper ethylene bonding? How are they impacted by the ligand properties of the amino acids? How does this affect the overall copper ethylene bonding strength? And how does this all relate to ETR1? Basically, can we apply our chemical knowledge to understanding how this reactivity functions proteins? And so our first investigation, I remember doing this, uh, this was before we even had our computational lab. In an old lab, uh, Dr. Price had a, an, an old computer with Gaussian, which is one of the, um, the programs that we use. And he taught me how to use it. I didn't know any of this stuff before I started here at Stetson. And I started looking at this simple compound. It was the, one of the first known copper ethylene complexes that had ever been synthesized back in 1986. And I wanted to kind of get my feet wet and try to start learning how to understand these copper complexes uh, computationally. And in the study, uh, the author also looked at all of these different substituted phenanthrolene ligands. They contain nitrogen, but they've also got all of these uh, different um, substituents on there that changes the electronic nature of these. And so I thought, just scouring the literature, this would be a really good opportunity, number one, to get some experience computationally, and number two, to try to see how does the ligand impact the copper ethylene binding. And so um, I also saw in this early um, uh, investigation or this early paper that, um, okay, thanks, Melinda. Um, I also saw that in this early um, paper that the authors saw that they could take this acetonitrile complex, acetonitrile is another small molecule, and react it with ethylene to displace to form the ethylene complex. And that the strength of the binding, the binding constant, was linearly related to the properties of the ligand. And that a more uh, basic ligand would, strong, would form a stronger copper ethylene bond. And so this was the, the presumption for basically since 1986 up through about 2006, you know, so for 30 years, the entire, uh, copper ethylene community basically believed that more donating ligands are going to form a stronger copper ethylene bond. So I wanted to re research this and see if I could figure out, is this true and why? Um, so the first thing I needed to study, and I was working with uh, a couple students with this, is how does copper bond to ethylene, right? And so there's two ways. This is getting kind of technical, but it's, it's impossible to, to talk about it uh, without it, that Alkenes bind to metals in two different ways. Uh, they bind where the alkene actually gives some electrons to the metal. And then we see that in some ways the metal gives some electrons back to the alkene. So both of these can happen simultaneously. And both of these are going to weaken the strength of the carbon-carbon bond in the ethylene. 
And we can measure this uh, experimentally by looking at the carbon-carbon bond length, the strength of the vibration, the chemical shift uh, in the nuclear magnetic resonance um, spectrum of these things. So I, I kind of understood a little bit about how the bonding between the copper and the ethylene um, interact. How can we see this computationally? So my computational strategy was to first obtain structures of all the compounds that I wanted. I always wanted to compare them with experiment to make sure that my computation was good. Uh, I would use a variety of different uh, methods to understand um, the, the interactions between the metal and the alkene. Um, if you're a chemist, some of this stuff makes sense. I'm not going to go into too many of the details. Um, and also, just in the end, to find out how strong is the bond between the copper and the ethylene. Um, and is it, is it a covalent bond? Is it ionic? What are the repulsive uh, pieces of this? So again, a reductionist strategy. I want to, I, I'm kind of OCD when it comes to uh, investigating things. I like lots of numbers and quantifying things. So um, I wanted to know everything I could about these bonds. And so, as I said, I, I sat down in that little room with that computer working on this first compound, and Dr. Price told me about natural bond orbital, orbitals, uh, NBOs. And he said, you know, you can look at these orbitals uh, on the alkene, and they tell you by looking at them how, much, how many electrons are in them, and that gives you a way of measuring the back and forth uh, transfer of electrons from the metal and the alkene. And so I said, okay, this, this sounds pretty good. Um, looking at the ethylene orbital, this pi orbital, you could see um, how much electron density was in it. So we could measure how much had been given to the copper. And in this other one, we could see the pi star, we call it, how much electron density had been given from the copper to the ethylene. And when we measured this, um, we saw basically um, we could very easily quantify how many electrons, fractional electrons, had been given in each direction. And we could quantify which is more important. And this was really interesting um, because, again, in all of the discussion of copper ethylene chemistry, the entire focus is on what we call the back bonding portion. You know, this portion over here that I'm showing. Um, the other side, which is almost half as important, is completely ignored. And, and so this was very enlightening to me that I felt like maybe some really important stuff was being missed. We also looked at the impact of the ligand substitution. So what happens when we change these different ligands? We saw a really nice linear relationship between the bond and how much electron density the ligand could give the copper. Um, this was really interesting. Uh, another interesting piece of this is that the changes in the bonds are so small that you would never see these trends experimentally. Uh, even though they're real, experiment can never give you any input, uh, any information on this. You have to use the computation. Um, we also looked at these important NBOs, and we saw, again, very nice um, linear relationships here that we could quantify. So this was very, uh, very uh, satisfying. Um, we were able to look at some molecular orbitals. Again, as Dr. Price said, we use artwork to, to, to demonstrate these kind of bonds. And so for my inorganic students, this is the molecular orbital diagram for these interactions and um, between the metal and the alkene. And we use this number here, which is basically identifies or quantifies the interaction between the metal and this empty orbital of the ethylene, which we will continue to use. And finally, we were able to quantify how strong the bond was. And interestingly, we were expecting the more electron donating ligands to create a stronger ethylene copper bond because that seemed to fit what was in the, uh, the literature. But what we saw was that it didn't work out that way at all, that basically the bonding was identical within experimental error between all of the different compounds. And this kind of flustered us a little bit because it didn't make sense. Um, what about this reaction that we had seen where more electron donating ligands should make that copper ethylene bond stronger? And it turns out that we were looking at it all wrong. 
what we saw was that it had nothing to do with the strength or the stability of our product. It actually had to do with the stability of our starting material, our reactant. The reactant was actually destabilized by electron donating uh, ligands, and which pushed the reaction where we wanted it, but for a totally different reason. And so we were able to publish this, uh, two students and I, uh, Naomi Pernicone and, and Jacob Jerry, and we were very excited by this. Um, and uh, we decided, okay, uh, what next? So as Jacob liked to call it, we tried our bag o ligands approach. We went at every known copper ethylene complex in the literature, and we started um, doing similar calculations on them. Uh, one interesting note here is that we have a sulfur-containing uh, ligand here. There was only one of those. Uh, Judith Burston at University of Wisconsin had synthesized that in her lab. So that one, of course, we wanted to explore because it has sulfur in it, just like is expected in the protein. And again, I'm just going to kind of go through. We did our, our full analysis, uh, just like we had done with the, the previous um, yeah, Bago Liggins, that's a great band name. Um, so we went through and we did our similar analyses on all of these compounds. Um, but what we saw is that the sulfur seemed to, to make a really poor ligand choice for bonding ethylene. Uh, it didn't seem to be very activated. It didn't seem to have much interaction with the metal. Um, sulfur was a pretty bad ligand for binding ethylene. Um, when we looked at the strength of it, particularly comparing the, the sulfur and the nitrogen, we saw sulfur is a really bad ligand. Why on earth would nature choose to use it when the bond strength is so much less favorable than, say, just using nitrogen? And so we were kind of interested in this. We were kind of stuck there. Um, and then out of the blue, I got a, a call from Judith Burston at the University of Wisconsin. And she said, hey, I, I read your paper. Um, actually, both of them, and I've got some really interesting work for you. Um, we've made all of these new compounds with our thioether ligand, right? We've made the acetonitrile complex. We're able to react that with ethylene to get the ethylene complex, and also with cyanide and carbon monoxide to get um, these other compounds that are really useful for determining uh, ligand effects. We've got all this characterization on them, so... Uh, we would really love for you to step in and kind of help us understand what's going on. And even better, we've got all of the nitrogen analogs sitting there too, fully characterized. So this is a perfect system to basically take what I had done in theory in the previous uh, article that we had published and um, test it against a real system. So I was very excited to jump on this. Again, we did a comparison. Um, we used uh, NMR characterization. The numbers I've shown here, the NMR data on the left is my predicted values using my computation. The ones in parentheses are the, um, the experimental values. And you can see, for, for you chemists out there, these are pretty much dead on um, for getting uh, a prediction from a, a computational standpoint. So um, we saw these. Uh, in all these cases, we looked at the bond links. We looked at the vibrational frequencies. We looked at the MBO occupancies, the bond orders. In all cases, we see that the, um, the interaction between the metal and the alkene is much stronger in, uh, with the nitrogen donor ligand than sulfur. Um, we looked at all of the different uh, analogs with the different carbon monoxide and acetonitrile. Again, in all of these cases, we see that the nitrogen is a much better ligand for bonding. Uh, binding energy saying uh, all the binding energies are much stronger um, are much stronger with the nitrogen donating ligands. Um, so it, again, it seems like maybe nature chose poorly to uh, to use sulfur. I don't know. Um, we tried to understand what was going on using our molecular orbital interactions again. Um, these are very complicated, um, but what we basically see is that um, the problem with the sulfur is that the sulfur spreads out the important electron density that it needs to give to the copper 
to allow it to donate electrons to the alkene. Um, whereas the nitrogen keeps it very focused and localized and um, makes it much better for bonding to the copper. And so this was very interesting. Um, and at the same, so I, I shared this information with, with uh, Judith Burson. She was very excited about this. And then she says, I've got another, I've got another interesting, um, remember all that phenanthrolene chemistry that you did um, in your previous paper. Um, we're looking at this reactivity here. It's the same kind of phenanthrolene, but we've got these big tert butyl groups on here. And I want you to see what you can do with this um, computationally. And so I immediately took this without any information from her. And I ran my calculations um, from scratch. And I got these really funky looking bonding um, where the copper is really pushed out of the plane. The ethylene's bonding way up out. Um, it was really perturbed. And so she said, what did you get? And I said, well, it looks really strange, you know? And so she said, well, send me a picture of it. And when I sent the picture of this, you know, she basically fell out of her chair and said, um, that's exactly what we see experimentally. So when you overlay the experimental structure with my calculation that I got basically from scratch, uh, you can see that they're pretty much identical, which she was a skeptic uh, with the, uh, concept of computational chemistry can it really work um, this was you know convinced her that it does work it is very accurate and so we then went forward uh, with this project as well and what she found was that with two of these big ligands on there it's a really deep orangish brown color and when you react it with ethylene it turns colorless it kicks off one of the ligands and that they can see this spectroscopically by a change in the UV vis spectrum. And they were very interested in using this as an ethylene sensor. Okay, the, uh, designing sensors that can detect ethylene are, is a really hot topic because millions of dollars of fruit are lost every year, hundreds of them actually, by fruit ripening too fast on its way to, to, to sale. So if you can somehow monitor the ethylene, uh, control it, so that it's not released by the plants, um, you can save billions of dollars uh, over the long term from this. So I jumped in to try to understand this. And so I compared the bonding between our traditional flat phenanthrolene and our ditert butyl phenanthrolene. And we saw interesting things that the phenanthrolene unsurprisingly interacted much better in most cases. There was some in interesting issues with the, uh, the proton NMR between these. Um, all of the other pieces indicated that the phenanthrolene uh, activated the ethylene better, but with the ditert butyl phenanthrolene, the proton NMR seemed to suggest otherwise. Um, that's another story. If you're a chemist and you're interested in that, we can talk about it. We know why, but I thought I'd throw it out there. Uh, everything else, again, all of the standard things, we see um, the phenanthrolene activating more um, which we expect because it interacts more strongly. Uh, the interesting thing was that she also found that this uh, this compound would react with other small ligands like uh, I said CO2, it should be CO, carbon monoxide, et cetera. But the, just the phenanthrolene analog is totally unreactive. Why is that? Why does her compound work as a sensor but the, the unsubstituted one does not? And so I did a lot of calculations on this and found that it's approximately 80 kilojoules per mole more unfavorable for this thing to lose one of those phenanthrolene ligands. It's just too energetically unlikely. And hers, those big bulky substituents, makes the ligands bond just tight enough to hold on, but they're easily pushed off. So they had kind of found this sweet spot that they could make a sensor, um, but we couldn't with this this other compound. So. Uh, it was another really interesting problem, but what about ETR1? You know, we've been focusing on that. How we, we've learned a whole lot about how copper binds with ethylene and how ligands um, affect things. But what about this ETR1 question? So that's what I've been working on a lot recently, um, both in my summer grant last year and what I'm going to be working on uh, next year in my sabbatical, is trying to focus more on what I can find out about ETR1. Uh, again, um, we have this linear chain of amino acids. 
And all of these other proteins that I've shown you, they're easier to study because we have crystal structures of them. We know what they look like. We know where the metals bind, so we can use that as a starting point. There is no crystal structure of ETR1. There probably never will be because it's a, a membrane-bound protein that are very hard to colonize. So I spent a lot of time over the past several years trying to see how can we predict protein structures just knowing the primary amino acid sequence. And as Dr. Price will uh, um, agree with, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, but there's this new strategy called evolutionary couplings. And this evolutionary couplings, it's put out by a group at Harvard, and they have this server that you can use to do it. What it basically does is it uses the primary amino acid sequence. It looks through millions of other types of proteins that are similar to it. It looks for um, homologous structures, similarities, and it basically creates what it calls an evolutionary coupling contact map. It sees which amino acids have mutated through time uh, together and assumes that those mutations occur close to one another in the protein uh, structure. And then it takes that contact map and it comes up with um, an array of possible structures. Um, and using this, I was able to get this folded protein structure, an, an approximation of ETR1. But this is a really uh, accurate way of doing this. They've been uh, studying the COVID proteins recently with these, and they get really high level of accuracy uh, with these predictions. So I went and started using this model as my folded protein structure. And when we zoom in and we look at it from a, a molecular standpoint or an atomic standpoint where we can see all the amino acids, if we zoom in to this section here, we see this. And here's our little cysteine 65 and our histidine 69, which were basically implicated back in 1999 as the possible binding sites for the copper if we go in, we can actually insert a copper in there, and ethylene will bind very nicely. Um, this is very strong evidence that this is probably exactly what's going on in the uh, in the protein in some way or another. Um, that this just being happenstance is probably not likely. So what I've done from there is take these structures and study this, just like I've done everything else, looking at what the likely binding is like in the, the protein and compare it to, say, the phenanthylene ligands that we've been studying, using all the same kinds of things. And here's what very interesting, that this cysteine-histidine um, ligand set really activates it, even more than our phenanthylene. The, bond, the CC bond is longer, um, the bond order is lower, there's much more electron density in the important orbitals. Um, it's a highly activated ethylene molecule, way more than even some of the highly activated synthetic complexes. The interesting thing, though, is when we look at the binding energy, the binding energy compared to the phenethylene is way, way lower. It's even lower than the synthetic analog, which is incredibly uh, unstable. So it gives us a very highly activated ethylene molecule, but an incredibly weakly bound ethylene. Um, so that this, this cis-his ligand set um, gives a very activated ethylene, but a really weak bond to copper. And this kind of makes sense if you're, if you're nature trying to design a system that recognizes a molecule like ethylene. You don't want the ethylene to bind too tightly. You want it to be used as a hormone, a signal. So you want it to bind, you want it to do what it needs to do, but then you want it to come unbound and go away when you don't need it. And, and it seems like maybe nature's figured out how to do this um, using this very unique set of ligands. Um, and so this is where we're at right now. Um, this is all still very preliminary. Right now, I have to really up my game again and learn a completely new set of uh, computational techniques. Um, to really study these proteins, you have to use what's called QMMM calculations, quantum mechanical, molecular mechanical uh, calculations. They're very computationally intensive. Um, it's, it's a long struggle just to get to the point where you can, where you can get 
publication quality data. And that's where I'm at now. And that's what I'm going to be doing this year. And then in the next spring on my sabbatical is trying to work through that and get higher quality um, structures of this protein and try to understand the binding even more in a more detailed way. Um, but I think that we're the only group in the world that's really, or uh, I say group, me and my students, that really use this unique set of different analyses to, um, to understand copper ethylene bonding from this kind of uh, very detailed standpoint. I will just say um, there's another group that just published a similar result from this in Nature last year. Nature is one of the other two biggest um, scientific journals in the world where they use a similar computational methodology to get a folded protein structure. And um, our paper, our initial paper on the copper ethylene phenanthylene stuff was their only cited source for computational work in copper ethylene chemistry. So to be cited in nature in such a, a revolutionary paper was pretty, pretty gratifying as well. And finally, um, you know, as an acknowledgement, so that's, that's kind of a story in a roundabout way of where my research has gone over the past uh, 13 years or so. I'd like to thank a lot of the people that were involved in this work. A lot of students, this is not all of them, um, but some of the main ones, Jacob Jerry, he's now at, at Princeton on a postdoc. Naomi Pernicone, she's now finishing up her PhD in Israel. Uh, Mary Jane Simpson, she uh, got her PhD at Duke. Christine Green at Georgetown. Patrick Grudzian is now at the University of Illinois. Um, Ashley Simone uh, was at Colorado State. Uh, Luis was, is now at Cornell. Rachel, I'm not exactly sure where Rachel is right now. Um, and then Ricky, of course, our very own Ricky, worked with me on this stuff many years ago. Um, I'd like to also thank everybody in the chemistry department, all the faculty, uh, um, staff, Bill Furlong over the years was an invaluable help. And then the funding for all of this stuff was, of course, you know, from the ACSPRF, um, the NSF, and Stetson. So with that, I will um, be happy to answer any questions, uh, have a conversation, um, and just thanks for thanks for paying attention. Hopefully, hopefully it didn't all go out into the ether and, and was at least a little understandable. Not at all into the ether. This was absolutely wonderful. It was so cool to hear about your research, uh, Dr. York. Um, and I'd love to sort of help moderate some questions from the chat. And I also have some of my own. So maybe just to get us kicked off, um, I'll ask a couple of the ones that I developed and then see how other folks want to interact with that. Um, does that sound okay? Oh, Tandy has a question. Um, I'll, I'll turn to them. For, uh, is that? No. Melinda, okay. go ahead. I, I can wait. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'll turn to you in just a moment then. Um, so I just am super fascinated, uh, John, by the scale of your research. So, you know, that image of Photosystem 2 um, and the engagement with water there versus your initial images of the Earth. Um, and I was thinking about how issues of scale might impact the tools you use in your research, which I now understand um, involve primarily those computational methods. So I wondered if you could speak a little bit to how your choice of tools is impacted or not by the scale of the considerations you have, whether or not that's tiny or huge or both? No, that's a great question. Um, so this, the scale of the types of molecules and systems that you're studying has everything to do with what you use to study them. So proteins are such, you know, they're small, but they're massive in terms of molecules. And so studying the molecules like a protein, even with computation, is very difficult because they're so big. So that's one of the reasons why we scale down and look at these little pieces of them, because those pieces we can model really accurately with calculations, whereas the big proteins, like I said, kind of where I'm going now, is really computationally expensive. It just takes forever. You know, so for instance, just to give you an idea, on my computers, which were pretty fast for the time, a single calculation on one of these molecules, and I showed hundreds of them, would take maybe three days to a week 
to run a, a single calculation. You know, so you're talking, and I have eight computers set up in my lab at a time running simultaneous calculations. To run the same calculation on, say, one of my proteins might take months. Um, so that's why having computational resources is important um, to be able to study the big pieces. And that's why I focus so much on the smaller chunks over the past few years, because I can do them. My students can work on them. Once you start getting into proteins, it's a whole different world because they're bigger. And then, like you say, the scale of the Earth down to us, if you take you know, the scale of the Earth and you look at us, if you take us, a protein is the same basic scale, even smaller, right? So um, that just kind of gives you an image of how small even proteins are. I'll just selfishly ask one more question before I turn it over to Tandy, and then we'll see sort of how some of my other questions relate or don't to what folks want to ask from the larger group. Um, so are there any lessons here about possible sort of high-tech solutions to climate change? Um, you mentioned lost fruit, um, which of course impacts agriculture, which in turn you mentioned the billions of dollars lost, right? But it could impact sure. climate. Um, so is there anything that you can see that would uh, be a lesson for climate change from your uh, research? So um, that's a good question. Um, so all of this kind of inorganic chemistry, you know, I, I like to tell Dr. Sybil this because he's an or organic chemist, you know, the 20th century was the century of organic chemistry. It was, you know, so many amazing advances in, in, in organic chemistry in the 20th century. The 21st century is going to be the century of inorganic chemistry because all of the main problems, like you say, climate change, energy production, um, from solar energy to fuel cells to all of these kinds of things, they are going to require um, inorganic compounds like these mimics of photosystem too and these mimics of nitrogenase and these kinds of things that can do um, that kind of chemistry. So um, a lot of this type of research, while it seems kind of maybe uh, very fundamental, um, there are a lot of potential applications like you say. So for instance, um, if we know how ethylene binds to this ethylene receptor and causes the plant to do all these things, if we can design other molecules that bind to that same receptor but shut it down, then perhaps you can keep fruit from spoiling on the way to, uh, um, to market, right? So uh, yeah. you inhibit that process. And so you can save lots, you know, billions of dollars of wasted fruit by inhibiting that reactivity. Um, so that, that's one possible way of doing that. Uh, again, like climate change with carbon dioxide, uh, if we can design inorganic compounds that can take the carbon dioxide out of the air, and we already know how to do that in some ways um, and convert it to other things, that's another way of combating climate change as well. So inorganic and compounds. And getting good food. I mean, so much of lost food and yeah. food waste is that distribution process, right, where you lose the food on the on the vine or, you know, in the yeah. truck. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Tandy. Oh, yeah. Melinda, you almost asked my question uh, there in the second part. Uh, and the first, Paul, great job tying your work kind of back to the big picture, how you did at the beginning. It's like invaluable for all of us, not just our students. But uh, so I guess my question, I, I'm thinking about the environmental problems that the world faces. And um, from a chemist perspective, so many of them involve doing something about elements in their most oxidized form. So like, you know, in Florida waters, nutrient levels, you know, involve nitrogen as nitrate and phosphorus as phosphate, you know, if you, if you want to get rid of those, uh, you know, get them, transition them back into their reduced forms, uh, uh, which nature can do, uh, but not fast enough. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, same thing in our atmosphere, the, you know, we're talking about carbon in its most oxidized form, carbon dioxide, if you want to sequester that. Uh, means getting it back into a reduced form. Um, what are our 
broad prospects for, I guess, metal or metal enzyme catalysis for solving those problems in your big picture? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, zinc, for instance, the, you know, um, there are zinc enzymes, much like the alcohol dehydrogenase, that convert carbon dioxide into uh, carbonate, you know, in carbonic acid, you know, so um, carbonic anhydrase. And so you can use metals to do that, um, binding of the metals to carbon dioxide to create some sort of catalyst that would convert it back into, say, carbonate that you could then sequester somehow. I've thought about that a lot, you know, how would, and I've actually done a little bit of work on that and a little bit of thought work on that too, but I think that we have metal catalysts that can do that. I think the uh, the problem is just one of the fact that you have to move a lot of atmosphere to remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And the the challenge is how do you move lots of atmosphere without generating more pollution than you are solving with the problem. So we need some sort of green solution for moving the atmosphere so that we can remove the carbon dioxide and then not make things worse at the same time. So I think that we've got the chemistry is is, is coming along. Uh, it's the uh, the challenge logistically of doing that. The same thing with water. I mean we can we've got chemistry where we can do those, you know, reduce nitrate to nitrite and those kinds of things. Um, going in the opposite direction. Um, it's just the scale of things is so huge. Hey, Melinda, may I? Yeah, add? Yeah. I'm going to have to head out. Hey, John. Um, yes, I hope I'm it clearly. <clears throat> yes. Thanks for a really great presentation because well, thank something you. I would like just to reiterate for uh, the non chemists amongst us is that one of the challenges we have as chemists is that we see molecules, but we work with things that you ha that you can't see and, and at, the, at, the, at their most reduced state, right? At the most reduced scale. And we have to extract this, this the, the, behave, the, the characteristics of how these pieces of matter interact with one another, you know? Um, and by by the tools that you we use right so you're using this this incredibly advanced computational modeling which isn't witchcraft <laughs> it's not black magic it's it's for you to get those results means that you actually you really do understand the parameters that are necessary to describe your system oh yeah or you won't get those results you know um, the visualization is really important for us as chemists, and that's why I mentioned the art. You know, those diagrams, uh, that's, that's a language for us. It's a representation. So um, great job. You know, you really clearly, I think you demonstrated all the different things that as chemists we, we, we need, to, the tools we need to use um, to understand, you know, our world at the molecular level. That was cool. Yeah, I, th I think you're so right, Harry. I mean, part of the challenge of being a chemist is making the abstract concrete enough to understand and to see. And so visualization for me is key. You know, if I can see it, it makes more sense to me. And so that's a challenge of, of a chemist is making things that are hard to see seeable. Yeah, so I agree. Thank you, Harry, and thank you, Tandy. Um, if anyone else like to raise their hand, please do so. Um, as we wait for others to surface questions, I'll go on to um, another question that I had. So in describing these reactions, um, you're describing a sort of deeply contingent process, or at least that's what was really striking me when you're talking about photosystem two, sort of stealing electrons from water, you know, nearby, those things that are available. So I was wondering if you're often seeing repetition in these reactions? How do you recognize these kinds of reactions? How do you discover new ones? Do they have patterns, right? Um, or are they highly varied? 
Uh, and so uh, I just was curious about that. You know, use these metaphors of balance and chaos. I don't know, those neither are good, you know, for particular things. Um, what, are, what are you seeing um, in terms of patterns in these processes, if anything? I mean, that's, that's a great question. I mean, when you think about life, you know, this is the way I think about it. You know, when I see life, all life is, life is basically a self-sustaining chemical reaction. It, it, it's, it's a system in which the chemical reactions are able to sustain themselves, right? So um, growing and, and, and reproducing, these are just, it's, it's all chemistry. It's all atoms following the rules that are set, um, set forth. And so, yeah, there are lots of patterns. That's the thing that I'm starting to see. The more I dig into na to, to the, the, the details of this kind of reactivity, it's um, the more elegant the patterns seem to be, right? That, that, that there's repetition. Nature finds a way of doing things and then sticks with it. Every now and again, you'll see some variation. But um, what we see in nature, and that's why I like using nature as inspiration, is nature's had four billion years to figure out how to do this chemistry. And it's come up with some really good ways of doing it that we can't even fathom, you know? So that's why we keep looking at these proteins is because we see things there that we can't even really imagine ourselves. And then we see it and we use that as inspiration to try to reproduce it and maybe tweak it a little bit. So a lot of my research that I've done um, I take this inspiration from the copper or alkene chemistry, and then I transfer it to other metals, like gold, for instance, right? Nature can't use gold to do chemistry because it's just not readily available enough, but I can, you know, so, and, and other chemists can. So we take the inspiration from what nature does, and then we plug in some of these other metals and try to make new chemistry, you know, using, you know, instead of copper, Mm -hmm. Gold is just below copper. Gold is uh, is a sibling of copper or silver, you know, and so we try to expand upon that. So nature is inspiration is kind of a big theme in bio inorganic chemistry like this. But you were surprised and not necessarily in a positive way by the choice of sulfur, right? So you mentioned this, like nature chose poorly. And that really sort of like got me thinking about this question of pattern. Do you think... I think well, I think that I, I think one of the points I was thinking of is like when we first saw it, it looks like it chose poorly. But the reality is that um, once we started to dig more deeply, we realized that maybe we were wrong. You know that uh, nature almost never chooses poorly because if it works, then it works well. Um, so we that it what we find is more often than not it's not that the reactivity is surprising it's that our presumptions are wrong our assumptions are wrong and we think one way and we think we've got it figured out and for 20 years scientists will publish you know it's about this it's about this and then you dig deeper and you realize it's not that at all it's you know maybe Maybe the observation was correct, but the reasoning was wrong. And so that's kind of what I like to do is try to find the real reason. So I think nature chose right. We just didn't understand what nature was doing. Interesting. Thank you. Um, well, if there are no other questions, um, we may it may be time to close uh, the session. But thank you so much, Dr. York, for such a fascinating presentation. I really appreciate it. And I am glad that we had a great turnout today. So thank you all for coming.